Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to my session. Really appreciate it. On a Tuesday, day second, five o'clock. I'm sure everybody's tired and want to go to the happy hour or the event that is happening. But I promise you, this is going to be interesting. I know you heard about uh, Kubernetes from many speakers today, and it's, it's not going to be the same boring presentation. So my presentation, when I practice, takes about 25, 30 minutes, which I'm not going to do that. Torture to you and me. I have a a demo that should be about 20 minutes, that'll be more interesting. But just to put things into uh, perspective and context, let's just go through a few of the slides. So my name is Said Agrawal. I'm an expert application engineer, also known as senior principal software engineer with uh, Discover Financial Services. And I see a lot of my folks here. So guys, hello, thank you for coming. So let's get into it. So the agenda is pretty tight and I know I have 40 minutes. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so for the agenda, we're just going to do a quick introduction to Kubernetes. Uh, there are two slides on the architecture, which is ship's analogy. I think I'm going to skip that because that really gets into the details, but reach out to me, I can share the notes. But instead of that, I'll do a summarized version. Then I do want to talk about the key features of Kubernetes, benefits of Kubernetes, some best practices to follow when you're managing your uh, microservices, then why should you deploy your microservices using uh, deployment and not uh, bare metal uh, pods? Then we do the deployment demo. And there are the deployment demo is very interesting and I'm going to show you how to use deployment using different deployment uh, strategy. We'll uh, conclude and I do want to leave some time for Q&A. Even if you do, if you don't get time left, I'm here, I'm always around, you know, just catch me, we'll do that. All right, so Kubernetes being the buzzword has made enormous noise in the recent few years because of the out-of-the-box features it provides to organization. It has become the de facto tool for container deployments on the cloud for firms around the globe. It has opened a whole new era of innovation on the cloud for businesses today. So Kubernetes is an open source orchestration platform that automates containerized applications deployment, scaling, and management. We all know it was originally uh, developed by Google, but is now maintained by CNCF. Kubernetes is extensively used in production environments to handle containers. And we know as businesses continue to adopt cloud native architectures, the need for scalable, reliable, and manageable application delivery processes, they become increasingly important. So Kubernetes can be a powerful platform for managing containerized microservices or applications at scale. But what does that do? That allows the teams to focus more on building and delivering high quality applications faster with easy to change configurations and versions. And because it can work anywhere with any container runtime and on various infrastructures with different environment and uh, configuration, you can basically use the same approach, whether you're hosting it on your own laptops, in your own on-prem data centers, could be a private hybrid cloud or with any a public cloud uh, providers. So the slide that I want to skip is this one. I like it because you, know, you can do uh, the architecture of Kubernetes understanding from the ships and the port that controls all the ships and all the activities that happen. But instead of that, in the interest of the time for demo, we'll quickly summarize the architecture. I'm sure most of you guys know. So, for simplicity, you know, we have a, a master node, a few worker nodes. For a highly available Kubernetes cluster, usually that's not the case. You have a few masters, thousands of worker nodes. So, so let's see, one master node, the master node, which is also known as a control plane, its main job is to look all the operations around the whole cluster, right? Everything has to be up and running and in sync and all that. So it cannot do it alone. It needs these four main components. The first one that you see is the API server, which is a brain the nervous system of the cluster, any communication that we as users or any other app that has to do with the cluster, they go through the API server, it's an API. So if I want to create new parts, right, I talk to the API. If I want to change some configuration, I talk to the API. Scheduler is the one that says, okay, there's a part that needs to be deployed on some node, so it will schedule it. It will see what does the part need, like what are the resource constraints in that. Does it need a special node like taints and tolerations? The controller manager is like the control loop. It looks for any nodes that are failing, spin up another node. 
are there any uh, uh, containers that are failing, make sure the current state meets the desired state, right? HCD is a highly available key value pair distributed database. All the activities, all the events that happen that are logged in there. And any kind of, so Kubernetes uses the functionality of HCD to do checks on the uh, cluster health, the configuration data. It is also used in case of cluster failure. You back it up and you restore from there. On the worker node, if you see, Docker doesn't have to be Docker, can be any a container runtime because you're running containers, right? You need that software. Kubelet is like an agent that sits on every node and back communicates with the API server. It gets instructions, hey, I need to be spinning up a pod, right? And it sends reports periodically to say the health of the node, the health of the containers. Kube proxy is the one that enables the communication between different containers. So let's see if you have a web app running in one container on node one and a database running on node two. So how does that communicate? Kube proxy makes that available. So that was quick. Let's move on to the next one. So the key features, starting from service discovery, it's a process of figuring out how to connect to a service. Kubernetes service discovery finds services through two approaches, using the environmental variables or using DNS-based service discovery to resolve the service name to the service's IP address. Load balancing identifies containers by the DNS name or even IP addresses and redistributes traffic from high load to low load areas depending on the traffic congestion. Uh, storage orchestration. So Kubernetes natively provides some solutions to manage storage. This feature allows automatic mounting of any storage type of your choice. It could be a local storage, uh, network storage, or a public cloud uh, provider storage. Secret and configuration management. This is a critical feature of Kubernetes that plays a significant role in enhancing the security of your applications. It provides a se uh, secure mechanism for storing confidential information, such as passwords, API keys, or other credentials by encrypting them and controlling access to them via, via RBAC. Moreover, Kubernetes also offers robust configuration management capabilities, and hence enabling you to manage application configuration data efficiently. So basically, you don't have to combine your application code with configuration code. It sits outside that. Kubernetes you know, allows you to use uh, config maps for that. Automatic bin packing. This is one of the significant features of Kubernetes. Why? This is where Kubernetes helps in automatically placing containers based on the resource requirements limits other constraints without compromising on availability. So it, it can very well mix critical and best effort workloads to manage utilization and save more resources. Self-healing, another one feature of Kubernetes. I call it as a, this feature is like a superhuman. Containers that fail because of any reason are automatically restarted. If any node fails, the containers that were running on the failed node are redistributed to other nodes. Kubernetes will automatically stop any unresponsive containers if they do not respond to the user-defined health checks, and they will restrict the traffic until the containers are ready. Automatic rollouts and rollback, and we'll actually see an example of that. This feature allows team to working on Kubernetes to define the state of deployed containers. They can define how to systematically roll out changes with ease and automatically roll back on failure or in any cases of emergency or alerts. So in order to do all this in order to manage our containerized microservices or applications. Kubernetes uses a set of abstractions. And some of them you see here is uh, deployment, which creates a uh, replica set and, and the pods and the services to hit the pod. Now that we understand what Kubernetes is and how it works, let's discuss the benefit of using Kubernetes to manage containerized microservices at scale. Scalability. Kubernetes is, is built to be highly scalable, which means you can easily handle many containers by deploying and managing them with ease. This makes it the perfect platform to manage applications that need to rapidly scale up or down in response to changes in demand. Resilience. Kubernetes is built to be very resilient with features like automatic recovery and rolling updates that ensure your applications stay up and running even if individual containers or nodes fail. Very important, right? Consistency. It will provide you a consistent environment for managing containerized applications, which means 
you can deploy it and manage in the same way regardless of where you're running. Remember I said initially you can do it on your laptop, is the same consistent environment. Portability. Now, because it's an open source uh, platform that can run on any infrastructure, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, this means you can easily move your application, lift and shift, between different environments without having to worry about any compatibility issues. Automation. Kubernetes automates various tasks involved in deploying and managing containerized applications, including scaling, monitoring, and load balancing. This can substantially decrease the time and effort necessary to manage your application. It's very important. Resource optimization. Kubernetes allows you to optimize your resource utilization by automatically distributing workloads throughout your cluster based on available resources. This can assist you in reducing infrastructure cost by ensuring that resources are not being wasted. Developer productivity. All of us are engineers, all right? Kubernetes offers developers a uniform and standardized platform for deploying and managing applications. This simplifies the development process, allowing developers like us, or engineers I call them, to concentrate on writing code instead of worrying about the underlying infrastructure. And last but not the least, ecosystem. We all know Kubernetes boasts a broad and dynamic ecosystem of tools and services that can be utilized to enhance its capabilities. This allows you to seamlessly integrate Kubernetes with other tools and services that would create a potent personalized platform that meets your precise requirements. All right, guys, I'm trying to rush through this so I can go to the demo, which is always the fun part for all of us. So anyways, so while Kubernetes provides a powerful platform for managing our containerized microservices at scale, it's important to follow best practices to ensure that your microservices are secure scalable and reliable. So here I've listed some of them. Uh, namespaces, what are namespaces provide a way to divide a Kubernetes cluster into smaller virtual clusters, which can be used to organize your microservices based on their function or team. And by using namespaces, you can limit the visibility and access of resources to specific teams. So whoever doesn't need access will not be given access. And you can also prevent resource name conflicts because you belong in the namespace, so if you have a pod or deployment with same name, because in different namespace, they won't clash. You use labels to select and manage your microservices. Labels are key value pairs that can be attached to Kubernetes resources, and are used to select and manage those resources. By using labels, you can easily group and manage your microservices based on common characteristics. Some of them could be like a label with a release, which environment, which tier, whether it's a web tier, uh, database tier, middle tier. And uh, labels can also be used to control access using RBAC. That's very important. Config maps, we already know config maps allows you to separate your configuration data from your application data. So if you make a change to the configuration, you don't have to rebuild your power, redo everything, right? Secrets are pretty much like config map, except that they have a purpose. They, st they store sensitive data. Use probes to ensure that the microservices are healthy. So this is very important and you know, not easy to do, but they're important. Probes are Kubernetes resources that can be used to check the health of your microservices. By using probes, you can ensure that your microservices are running and responding to the request. So Kubernetes will provide you of three types of probes, liveness probe, readiness, and startup. Liveness probes are used to check whether a microservice is still running. Hey, are you still alive, right? Readiness probes are used to check whether a microservice is ready to receive traffic. And startup probes tells you that, hey, I've done initializing, I'm ready. Use auto-scaling to scale. So there is a resource called HPA Horizontal Port, uh, Port Auto-Scaling that allows you to automatically scale your microservices based on the resource utilization or custom matrix. So by, by using auto-scaling, you can ensure that your microservices are always running at the right capacity, and then and you avoid over-provisioning or under-provisioning. Network policies, another one, very important. Now, we all know every part can talk to every other part in the entire cluster, right? Not a good thing. So that's, that's when we use network policies to secure your microservices. They provide a way to define network access controls for your microservices. By using network policies, you can restrict access to your microservices based on the namespace, the labels, or any other characteristics. 
What does this do? This can help you to prevent unauthorized access or attacks on your microservices. All right, so why should you use deployment to deploy your microservices? Deployments simplify updating hundreds of parts container images by just updating the container image name version declaratively. So basically, you know, in, in a high available, in a, in a real time situation, you don't have one or two replica, you have hundreds, right? So imagine if you didn't use a deployment abstraction, but part, you have to go to every part's definition and change it. Not, not a good situation. So that's when deployments help you. And there are different deployment strategies that you can use. The first one that we see here is called rolling update. So just in the slide that you see, it will create the new parts first. So number two, the, the second quadrant, and then destroy the old parts, allowing no downtime for users. So let's say if you were running about four replicas, it's going to create the first, first replica of the second part, then kill that, and so on and so forth. So your users will not suffer any downtime. The second strategy is called recreate. Now this is completely opposite of rolling. Recreate means it will kill all your parts first, and then, then you know, bring the new ones. Please do not do this in production. Imagine if you have thousands of parts, right? So, and I'm gonna show you an example. Bringing them down, if somebody was on your app and it's very critical, high availability, you, you promise the SLA is a 99.99999, right? And then you, 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 you use this, somebody's on your thing and the connection is gone. Imagine the kind of reputation that you're building, right? So you can, this is for experiment. I don't know why it's there, it's there, but don't use this in uh, uh, production. Staging, development, experiment, good. Blue-green. So blue-green allows to have parallel services running at the same time. Blue, which is existing, running, and green is now new one. The disadvantage is you have double the number of parts. Advantage is you get to test in production. Now, I always have to think, people say, before we go to production, we have a production-like environment. It's never same. So if I, if I get an opportunity to test in production, which is like, ooh, this is awesome, right? So this, is, this, this kind of strategy would allow you to do that. Once you see your new features are working as expected, you can route your services to new ones and then kill the other one, the old ones. The fourth one is Canary. Canary deployments help understand how new features will impact the overall system operation while containing the possible spill over to a small group of users. So I'm like, you know, I don't want to just do a big bang, you know, like in the blue green or whatever. I want to start small. So 10% of my users will see the new features, right? And if the feedback is good, I may open it up to 20, just basically scale it up. But if that 10 didn't do good, eh, forget about it, we'll go back to the old version, redo things, right? So another variation of Canary deployment is dark or AB deployment, just like dark. The kind of deployment mainly works great to test features on a front end rather than back end. So uh, as, as opposed to uh, Canary. So dark is also known as AB. Users are unaware they are treated as testers for a new feature. They are in the dark about their role as testers. But what it does for us, in parallel, we can collect matrix to track the user experience. Things like, how are the users interacting with the feature? Are they finding it intuitive or easy to use, or are they just turning it off? So you collect all those things, right? And cool. Everybody ready for deployment, uh, demo? I am. All right, guys. Let's see if my playground is up and running. Come on. I always get scared with this demo guard, right? Please behave today. So, okay. So my playground is running. So just to show you, I have a multi-node, a multi-node. Come on. So I'm gonna do a get nodes quickly. So you'll see I have two nodes, master node, which is a control plane, and node one, which is a worker node. So we're gonna deploy some parts here using the deployment strat different deployment strategies. So for that, I have prepared a list of commands, makes it always easy not to fat finger and look silly. So I have some examples in my private uh, GitHub and I'm gonna run up to here. So basically, you know, I'm just great cloning, going into the uh, folder where the examples are. Then I'm creating a namespace, remember? As one of the best practices, create the namespace. So we are in open source, I'm doing a Kubernetes demo, so that's the namespace. 
Then I have some YAML files, that which is one is the uh, rolling deployment. Uh, so I create a deployment which has a blueprint of the parts, and I'm saying I want 10 replicas, and I'm going to create a service of type node port that can hit that, those parts, right? And then I just do a get to see how uh, did I create the deployments and so on and so forth. So let's do it. I'm nervous, but let's see. All right. All right, so, so the pods are somewhat getting created, some are, so we'll just run this again. Uh, one more time. I can do a watch on it, but watch never comes out, so one more. Yay, so we got 10 replicas done, right? So what this, when I created the deployment, if you notice, it also uh, created replica set under the cover. So if you see the cube curdle get a replica set, which is RS, there are 10 desired, 10 current, good to go. So now, let me see what does this app look like. So I've created a service to hit the parts of type node port. And if you see, I expose this port. So node port, you know, you can assign port, port number from 30,000 to, I forget, there's a range. You can assign one in that range or it'll assign to you. But in this case, I chose it. So to hit that, I'm going to go here and say view port. And 30120. Yeah, so I got my app running, right? So now if I refresh this a few times, just watch the last uh, five characters, you will see it changing. What is that? Because I have 10 parts, the service is load balancing the load across all the parts, right? Easy peasy, fun, right? So now weeks go by, I'm in my two sprints have gone by, new features come out, tested well, and I want to do a rolling update, right? Because Oh, okay, I'll, let me quickly show you what the YAML looks like. This will put things in context. So my file that I that I did a apply on was rolling up to this guy. So if you see my see this line here, 11, I'm using a rolling update. So this means if I make any change to my deployment, it's going to use a rolling update strategy. So now, instead of really going and changing the YAML file, I'm using an imperative command that, hey, set the image on this deployment change this to something else. In this case, is green. And then I'm going to check the status of the rollout. So let's do this. Come on. Go to my playground, and I'm going to... So if you see, the rollout is happening. So it's bringing up new part, killing an old one, bringing up new part. So what that does, and I should have gone to the browser, and if I hit... So now I got switched to my new version, which is green. Awesome, right? But while that was doing, if I, if I, and I'm a user, don't know what's going on. If I came here, there will be no downtime. I'll be slowly be switched over to the new version. All right? And if you look at the parts, the old ones are terminated and new ones are running. And you can tell them by the age. The new ones have, are newer and they were older, right? So that was a rolling update strategy. Now I want to draw our attention to a different one which is, uh, okay, be, uh, before that, rollback. So once you do a few changes to your deployment and things are happening, but down the road you find that one of what, whatever rollout you did did not go that well. So you, you can look at the history. In this case, the first one was, you know, that was initial deployment. The second one, we just ran this, we changed the image. And this new one is not working great. So what can I do to roll back? There's a new quick command that you can run. And the reason I'm showing you all this, as an engineer, is very important to really understand you know, what, what, what are you getting into. So this really helps you to learn the, uh, the whole technology. That's how I learned it. So, so what I can do is if I go here and I say, roll out, undo the deployment to revision number one, which is go back to number one. So I can, by the number I'm doing this, I hit enter. And if I go back and see, what should this color change to? Anybody? Keeping my fingers crossed. Yeah, love it. Awesome. All right, so that was rolling update. Now I want to show you the dangerous one that if you do this in production, which is recreate. So for that, what I'm going to do is first delete the deployment. And when I issue this command, it actually kills the deployment, all the parts, and the replica set. So you don't have to go and kill all of them individually. But I'll keep the service. So. Let's quickly look at the recreate. 
in the recreate, everything is same except this that I'm saying is going to be recreate. So the initial deployment will say, okay, recreate this is the first one. Anything after that I do, we'll watch what happens. So let's go back to the playground. I'm going to go to my, uh, I'm going to apply this YAML file. Okay, so deployment is there. Good. Uh, I can do a quick check. If I always like to do a quick check, like you do get status, anything you, any changes you make ever. So yeah, I got pods are running. Yep, I got 10 of them. And uh, this one should still be blue because I just changed the strategy. Now, what we're trying to do here is if I do this, same thing, and I'm changing to the new version, which is green, uh, let me actually do the rollout too. Go to the playground. So while this is happening, I'm going to go here, right, and hit refresh. Boom, connectivity loss because I'm doing recreate. I'm killing all the parts. The new parts are still coming up. Meanwhile, I'm on the site and I'm like, whoa, what happened here? So if you do this uh, production with thousands of parts, bad experience, right? You don't want to do that to your users. Eventually, it'll come up, but I don't know, maybe a minute, two, and I'm sitting here frustrated, right? So that was a recreate. Don't want to do that in production. We'll just give it a second. Are you guys enjoying this? All right, I'm just buying time for this to come up. <laughs> All right, so it came up and you know, I'm switched back to my new one, but I lost connectivity for a few seconds here and now I'm not happy, so. All right, so now we're gonna do, we're gonna kill the deployment again to demonstrate the blue-green. Okay, then I'm gonna to switch to, so recreate. No, recreate was done. I'm gonna do the rolling update back. I'll bring my original deployment with rolling update because that is a good one. Make sure they're up and running. Okay, cool. Now, okay, so now, now I'm doing blue-green, right? So for blue-green, I'm going to create a new deployment. And let's look at the deployment file quickly for the version 2. So if you look at rolling update deployment v2, I am doing, so I'm changing the image version right here. And I'm creating a new one because I do not want to disturb the blue, right? And remember in the picture, the blue is running, people are using it in production. This is green. So I want to create a new deployment, a new service to test them out. So I'm going to go to my playground and go back to the commands and say, hey, I'm going to create a new deployment, which I'm calling it version two, and same thing with a new service because nobody knows about the service except I know it because I want to test it. Right? And then now, if you run the same commands of get deployments and everything else, you're going to see there are two services. Now, can somebody tell me how do I hit the second service? The first service is still running on 2120, 3120, sorry. I don't want to disturb that. That's the blue one. People are using it. I, you know, I don't want to disturb my users. They're, they're having fun. But I want to test this because I've deployed now double number of parts. So if I go to my playground, you notice something, I gave it a new node port, right? So this is the one that I want to use. So what I can do is to test the new one, I can come here, go and say, okay, hit on this port and this is green. So I can sit and test this all day long. Nobody knows about that as in production, happily you know, doing this. Once I'm satisfied with this, I want to drive route of my services to the new one, and the way you do that is, um, all right, in this case, we'll just do a little editing, which is always fun. So I have my service definition file here. So I'm gonna do 
Rolling update as we see YAML. Type it out. So, so see, remember I talked about uh, labels and how they group resources. So this is how this, this is how service know. Hey, any parts which have these two labels, that's where I'm going to send the traffic. Right now, sending to blue, but I'm going to change this to. Can anybody tell me the label? Green. Okay. So. All right, so to make the change on the service, I'm going to run the kubectl, apply minus f, rolling update, svc, dot yaml. Before I do that, this one, which is not this one, I don't care about that, I've tested this. This 3120 now should become green because I'm routing all my services to that and keeping my fingers crossed. I go here and I go Hey, so I have directed all my traffic to the green parts. But as a good step, you always want to delete the old deployment and the old service because they don't serve any more any purpose to you. So you want to do a cleanup, kill that, kill that. So now you have a new deployment with version two and the, the original service is now pointing to that. So that was blue-green. Time check, we got 10 minutes more. Uh, I'll do the canary. Is anybody interested in seeing canary? Yes, yes, yes. All right, all right. I like that. So for canary, remember I said we, we ramp it up uh, slowly. So as first, because I have this new deployment, I'm going to say, hey, scale it down to nine. So again, imperatively, I can say issue this command. And uh, if you do this, it will say, okay, I'll scale it down to nine. And to check that, uh, let me just copy this. Parts. So there are nine parts running. One is terminated. Now I want to bring up, so this was our green, right? Now let's say our new version is blue, just because I had two examples. If the new version is pink, let's say, I'm going to create a... Um, what is that? Okay, so I have this Q portal scale. Let me see if I color web app in there. So let me go back to the, make sure I have that YAML in my GitHub. Yep, I have it. And that one is green, good enough. One, so one replica, I'm gonna start with one. So all I have to do is just Q portal, apply that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so now if you do number of parts, you should have 10, but uh, see what's going, it's the same service. If I do a few refresh, you should see a blue sometime pop up. Come on now, there you go. So I have one blue and nine parts. So that is, now you say, okay, now I want to do, I am satisfied that 10% is working great, I'm going to go and scale down my, this one to eight, right? And I'm going to scale because I have this deployment now. So I'm going to go back to my commands and I can now use this to say, make them two. So the number of parts should be still 10. And if you go to the browser, you should see two blues with different numbers. One, same number? Two, yeah, awesome. So that's how that you can keep scaling it down, scale it up, and that way then you can, you know, now you're done using a canary, but slowly ramping it up, so. So that was the canary. I don't have the dark or AB because that applies more to the uh, UI. So that was the end of demo. I'll go back to my presentation. And so in conclusion, right, we all saw, sorry, you're not supposed to see my notes. <laughs> all good. So in conclusion, 
Kubernetes is a powerful platform for managing containerized microservices or applications at scale. We also, it provides a rich set of features for orchestrating, scaling, and managing containerized microservices, making it an ideal platform for modern cloud native applications. Some of those features we discussed were service discovery, load balancing, configuration management, secrets management, automation, resiliency, rollout, rollback, automatic bin packing, self-healing, etc. With Kubernetes, you can simplify the, the deployment and management of containerized microservices, ensuring that they are always available and responsive to incoming traffic. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you found this presentation informative. Thank you, thank you. So now we'll open it up for questions, and hopefully I should have answers, but I have experts in the house who can help me. So I need reading glasses to read, but when I look at you guys, you're all fuzzy. So it's just weird, right? Do this. I'm going to say a total of four or five years. But you know, when I was introduced to that back at a Microsoft conference, it just went right over my head. It was like making no sense. Then you slowly got, got into it. But the only way you could learn is to get your hands dirty. So you know, if people say, oh, we have a cluster, we're running it in some managed Kubernetes clusters, we have this YAML file, without understanding what, what a pause deployment, and it's so important to understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do you, do you use like a managed Kubernetes, or do you roll your own? Oh, uh, I'm going to refer that to, I would love to answer that, or how do we answer that? I'm looking at many. <laughs> do we use a... Do you use like a managed like EKS or GKE? Or do you, no, not do you, yet. Not yeah. yet. We, we started our journey about five years ago. Okay. So at that time, there was things like ECS. Yes. yes. Right. Mm -hmm. more Docker based. So we started with OpenShift. Okay. So we're significant overhead to try to manage your own Kubernetes clusters. Yeah, that's why I was wondering. Thanks. Okay. Oh, no one's going um. <laughs> Good question, but some of them I rather defer it to. <laughs> Have you considered using Argo rollouts for deploying your services? Say that again, sorry. Have you considered using Argo rollouts? Argo rollouts. Mm, I mean, do you use Argo? In I don't know. Yeah, we do use uh, Argo workflows, uh, but uh, we have a special set of use cases where we use Argo, um, and we are relatively new uh, to using it in the app dev space, in the application space. Um, but yeah, it's it's very much uh, uh, on 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 the table for us. Thank you, Rob. I bought my whole team, so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, do you use uh, directly Kubernetes, or do you use like uh, tooling like Elm to manage your application? Do you know the answer, Keith? Yeah, and that? chart and uh, stuff like that. I am not sure for the answer. Do you know, Rob? What? Uh, sure. Uh, do you use directly Kubernetes, like uh, playing YAML file, or do you use tooling like uh, Microsoft N to package your application, like create chart, and it will uh, deploy all the pods and not everything together, or not? We use Helm charts. Okay. okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. 
Nikhil, you have a question. All right, so if there are no more questions, thank you for attending. I really appreciate you guys coming.